What is a mole? And we're not talking about the animal or the thing on your skin. We're talking about chemistry and how it's helpful to quantify the number of something that's being measured. It might be a solid, a liquid, or gas. That's likely going to be matter that consists of molecules. And what are molecules made out of? They're formed from atoms. Right? And there's many, many, many atoms, even in a small space like a cup. I mean, how much? There's a million times, a million times, a million times, a million atoms in just a cup of water. And the numbers become so large that it's easier to give it a name to refer to a measurable quantity of something. And we do this for other things, right? An analogy is eggs. If we have 12 eggs, we call it a dozen. 24 is two dozen. 48 eggs is four dozen. So the same thing here, where the mole can be described as something, typically molecules or atoms or ions, but a bunch of them, such that one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And that's a number known as Avogadro's number. Now, how is it used? Well, one mole of one atomic mass unit is one gram. Now, what's an AMU? You know, one hydrogen atom, for example, is roughly about one AMU. You can see the exact calculation down there at the bottom. But why is that helpful? For this, if you have a mole, for example, of water, you can do calculations easily, and that's 18.02 grams of water. All right, but how was Avogadro's number determined? Well, back in 1834, Michael Faraday stated that the amount of a substance liberated in an electrode is directly proportional to the quantity of electricity passed. All right, what does that mean? That's Faraday's laws of electrolysis. Um, basically, running a current with a charge through it uh, is proportional. As you uh, increase the current, more stuff accumulates, that substance, and it was proportional to charge. Now, even though Avogadro's number was sort of estimated in the 1800s, it wasn't until 1910 when the elementary charge was accurately measured that Avogadro's number could be refined and calculated to the number it is today. It's been refined since, but uh, pretty accurate back then. But that still doesn't explain why. You know, why that strange number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd? So, we're going to explore another relationship, right? Faraday found the relationship between charge and, and that number, or more specifically, a, a proportional to a mass of a substance, which later became Avogadro's number. But let's now relate Avogadro's number to constants from three other scientists. Who are they? Bohr, Planck, and Euler. But before we get into the relationship, we have to talk about the three constants. We'll start with Bohr. Right? The Bohr radius is the most probable distance between the electron and proton for a hydrogen. See the red line? There's the radius, and you see the constant. Next one is Planck. The Planck length is a really small unit of length, and as part of the Planck unit system, it's got other ones that I'll highlight too in a second. But Planck length is so small, right? If it were the radius of a sphere, let's just compare it to the electron, which itself is already incredibly small, right? Planck length would be more than a billion times a billion times smaller than the electron's radius. So obviously this is not to scale as in comparing that little white sphere to the electron on the left. All right, but to give you an idea of scales now relative, Let's just say that um, on the right, Planck length was maybe the size of a radius of a human sized beach ball. The electron in that case would be the radius of the Milky Way galaxy. That's how different in size this is. It's really small. All right, but why did I use a radius uh, as the length? Well, Planck length may indeed be the radius of something because here's some similarities. Now, on the left, you can calculate the mass of the electron. It's based on the magnetic constant, the elementary charge, and the electron's radius. And on the right, now you see some of the other Planck units, the Planck mass and the Planck charge. But you, you can see, circled there in red, is the electron radius and the Planck length. So uh, perhaps it is indeed a radius. Or right, one more to cover. Euler's number. Right, otherwise known as the mathematical constant E, the base of the natural logarithm. Right, it shows up in 
equations representing growth and decay. These are you know, time-based functions like compound interest or radioactive decay. And it also shows up in equations describing waves. You might remember this one with waves and Euler's number. Okay, but why cover those three constants? How are they related to the mole? Well, the most abundant element in the universe is hydrogen. And other elements, and since we're talking about moles, really all of the matter that we're measuring as moles, they can be formed from hydrogen. Helium, lithium now with uh, three protons, for example. You get the idea. But back to hydrogen, right? Since it's the simplest one. Now within hydrogen, the proton and electron interact through charge. And now you see the Bohr radius there, the most probable distance in hydrogen. All right, Faraday you know, found that their length, the Avogadro number is linked through charge, but really how does that interaction occur between the proton and electron? So let's assume something really small occupies that space between the proton and electron, something we can't see and we'll never be able to see because it's too small, something with a radius of Planck length. All right. Simple math here. What's that diameter? If it has a radius of Planck length, that's two Planck lengths, right? Two LP. Now, let's also make another assumption here that if proton and the electron are communicating, that it takes something that travels and interacts as oscillations, which are waves. And so the last assumption here is let's assume a separation distance now is one diameter, right, that's 2LP, times the base of the natural logarithm. That's Euler's number. Now, if we assume that is the separation distance. Let's shrink that now. Still not to scale, but let's try to fit something between that proton and electron separated at the Bohr radius. And here's the question. If something does exist, all right, how many of these would occupy the space between the proton and electron and hydrogen? And that's also simple math, right? You take that big distance and you divide it by that small one to get the answer. And what is it? It's Avogadro's number, one mole. Is that a coincidence? Well, I'll let you decide.